Nevin Village, with Carn Ingley dominating in the background. Back in the Middle Ages, this was an important political, administrative and spiritual centre. Now it's a little quiet backwater. These 18th century mounting blocks were used by the gentry to dismount and get on their horses with elegance before going to church. This is a dark, atmospheric way to enter the churchyard. Imagine doing it in the dark. But along here is the bleeding yew. This is the bleeding yew. It bleeds red sap. Well, it looks, it is red sap coming out of the tree and it has been doing it for hundreds of years and legend has it so it will continue until a Welsh king is crowned in the castle. This is a fine Celtic cross dating from the early 11th century and only one of three of its kind in Pembrokeshire and it has two inscriptions on it. One probably a name, Howan, and the other one DNS meaning Dominus or Lord. The Vitiliana stone has been dated by its Latin inscription to the late 5th or early 6th century and it's probably a monument to someone of that name. The Maglocuna stone is cemented into the windowsill. Inscribed in Latin and Ogham, it reads Maglocuni Fili Cluta, probably meaning Maglocunus, son of Clutorius. St Brunnock, to whom this church is dedicated, travelled over the sea from Ireland in the 5th century and a life was written about him in the 12th century. And he, he settled here because he had a, a very friendly reception from the local chieftain whose hill fort was above the church. One story which is told about him is that he, he loved to go to the top of Carningley and there it is said he would commune with angels and that is where Carningley gets its name from, the Hill of the Angels. And as we've seen, you can see it from here. It does dominate the area. And then on the feast day of St Brunnock in April, the tradition was that the local priest would not preach a sermon on that day unless he'd heard the cuckoo sing on the top of the 11th century cross. This is a medieval pilgrim's cross carved into the rock because along here was a popular pilgrimage route in the Middle Ages. These are the pilgrim steps which hundreds and hundreds of pilgrims would have walked um, back in the Middle Ages, realising that they weren't far from their destination coming down here. They must have been so glad and you can see in parts the footprints of where they've worn down the rocks. This is the site of Nevin Castle which was built in 1108 by the Normans but in the following years it was captured and recaptured by the Welsh and the Normans until it was finally burnt down in 1195. So all that we can see now are the moths and the banks and the ditches and the remains of two stone towers. It is difficult to imagine it now when it's so wooded, but this was a site which gave um, a good lookout over the surrounding countryside. 
and it was an important base here for the soldiers and for the pilgrims on their way to St David's. You can see from this drawing how extensive the castle was. We're standing in the bailey or the courtyard, this place here, and as it says on, the, on this board, this is, couldn't be more different now to it was, as it was in the 12th century when they would have had blacksmiths clanging, children playing, soldiers practicing, craftsmen toiling and animals penned within this one enclosure. Imagine the stench and noise. This is the Mott, a large man-made mound and it was built of slate bound together by clay because there was no limestone up here in North Pembrokeshire so that was a Welsh technique for around here. This is Carn Ingley where St Brunnock communed with the angels and we're going up a short steep path to the top. We've got to the boulder strewn outcrop on Carningley. We think we're pretty near the top, but for us it's, it's not really possible to go much further. But we've certainly got a wonderful idea of what it's like being up here and looking all around and maybe finding angels. We're looking up to the dramatic summit of Carningley and we're down amongst the heather and the bracken and the gorse and the wild horses and the butterflies and the bees. We've come down a different way from Carningley, a much easier way through the bracken and down the side of a stream on the sheltered slopes of Carningley. This is Pentra Even, the first ancient monument in Wales to have protection, which was done in the 19th century by Augustus Pitt Rivers. But what is it? Well, it was thought to be a chambered cairn for a long time and that it would have been covered over and underneath would have been the remains of burials. But no human remains have been found. And now the thinking is that maybe it was meant to be like this with the stone floating on the top. And of course the stones are blue stones, which are go to Stonehenge. And so it's a very impressive mystery. Folklore has it that the fairies and the elves come dancing around here in the night time. I don't know if anybody's ever seen them. This is Carrig Coiton Arthur, just outside Newport. A burial chamber done more than 5,000 years ago with a 17 tonne capstone on the top. When the excavations of 1979 to 80 took place here, they found an upturned cereal bowl with some remains of hum cremated human remains 
and um, evidence of milk and cheese. And so it said that because there were no cereals there, these people were herders, not farmers. But this is in a secluded little grove now, surrounded by holly trees and, and hedges. So different to Pentre, even on the top of a cliff. This is Castell Hentlis, a reconstruction of an Iron Age fort, which actually was the very place where the Iron Age hill fort was. But though it's called a hill fort, there's no evidence of fighting taking place here. And so it is thought that it was built by the chief and his people to show how important they were and trading would have taken place, but not the fighting. The village was reconstructed using the archaeological evidence of the post holes which have been found so they could get the right size of the different dwelling places and about the gates that led into the village, the fact that there were two gates and people would have to um, take their time to come in and be impressed by all that they saw. This is the chief's house, the biggest and most important in the village. And it was reconstructed in the year 2000. Here is the meeting house where the villagers would assemble to hear stories from the bard, or perhaps receive orders from their chief or the druids, or perhaps just to meet up and have a catch up over some beer. It's very welcoming with the fire to warm you and the colourful decorations all around the wall. This is a smithy's house and travelling blacksmiths would have been very welcome in the Iron Age as they would come to repair the tools and weapons and perhaps to make new iron objects for the people here. Here is the cook's house, not as luxurious as the chief's but still pretty comfortable. This little structure is the grain house, raised up so that the air can circulate underneath and keep the grain dry and also in the winter time the surplus grain would have been stored here which would have been very important and also it meant you were pretty important too if you could have enough grain to have a surplus in the winter time. It has been so interesting coming here and seeing this reconstructed village and it was really brought to life by one of the Celts who was explaining and drawing us all in as to why it was here, what were the purpose of the gates, what was the purpose of the houses. It was most illuminating and what we took home from us was that it was built more for prestige than for defence and that archaeology is never definitive, We're always discovering things which makes our understanding of the past perhaps change. And so it, it's been very rewarding. This is Newport Beach, a wonderful expanse, and the sun has come out to transform the scene from the drizzle that was obscuring it. And so the next port of call is Ireland, and we imagine the Celtic saints setting out from here to Ireland or vice versa. What a thought. Thank mm -hmm. you.